Fellowship, if you're guests with us, and um, we are having fun, aren't we? Amen. Oh man, praise God. Isn't it good that we can praise Him anywhere? Amen. I think that sometimes we take that for granted, like, oh, of course God would accept our praise anywhere. You know that the Christian faith is one of the few faiths where that's true. So many places, you have to go to a special holy place, you have to do everything just right, special sacraments, special religious obligations and rights, and here we just get to praise Him. Sing out to him. I love that. You know, this church, we've been doing some cool stuff around here. We had, I just put in my notes, work day success. Thank you so much. Last week, last Sunday uh, afternoon, we had a lot of fun around this place, and so many of you guys showed up, and I just want to thank you so much. Uh, And the rest of us who even weren't here, thank you guys, because it looks so good now coming in, gravel raked, and I mean, two humongous trailer loads of Uh, sticks and stuff picked up out of the property over here, windows washed, curtains washed, all kinds of stuff that was done. So so, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Pastor Jeff and Sue have started their trip. I believe they leave this morning and are probably on the road even now. Knowing Pastor Jeff, he likes to get a good start. And uh, so just encourage you guys, they're they're just taking a little time away, and uh, encourage you to pray for them that they just have a great time out on the road. I, I texted them this morning. I said, you know, you got your camper, your wife, and your dog in the open road. That's a good combination. Uh, So, uh, man, we we will miss them, but I know as a faith family, we'll pray for them, and that God will do his good work uh, to just build them up and uh, and bring them back safe. Child dedications today at the end of the service, so I hope that um, we're excited for that and looking forward to that. All three families that are going to be dedicating kids are in this service, so you all lucked out. Next service, we're just going to have to pray for them. and, and praise God for the children. We love them. We love, we love the children. Jesus said, let the little kids come. We say the same thing. Baptisms next week. If you've signed up for baptism, there will be a meeting after each service. So after this service, there'll be a meeting kind of over here in the fellowship hall. Where we'll just kind of go over some of the details for that if you've signed up. If you haven't signed up and you still want to be baptized, we'll be doing it next week. So you still have time to sign up. You can just come right on over after uh, the service and listen to that. Uh, kind of the details around that. And then last but not least, my wife celebrated a birthday last week. And so, love my wife. Praise God for another birthday. Um, She's getting better and better, folks. So let's jump into Matthew. The reason that we're here today, praise the Lord God in heaven, learn more about him. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, and um, we're going to jump through, kind of tackle a larger section today. We're going to read verses 1 through 21. You know, the scripture says that one of the reasons that you do gather together is for the public reading of scripture. So though this is a little bit longer section, uh, this is one of the reasons that we do it, is that we just proclaim God's word together. Before we go any further, let me just pray real quick. Let's pray as we get started. Lord Jesus, thank you for this wonderful morning. Beautiful out, Lord. Uh, we know that the, there's been some storms, and we pray for those people that are... Uh, are suffering the inconveniences that are brought with the, the wrecking of homes. and Father, we pray that uh, where it's appropriate, if we could help, that we would. Lord, um, yet we thank you for the rain. We know, Lord, that uh, it waters the grass, it waters the trees, all living things. And Lord, um, you said that you are living water. Father, I pray that you would water us today with your holy word that you would bring health to our bodies. Yeah, that you would give us the wisdom that it takes to walk these days in faithfulness, just as you would have us to walk. Father, we need your help. We love you. And it's together with us a big faith family, we praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's read from uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. It says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Sabbath was a Saturday. And his disciples became hungry began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, Have have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, and how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat? nor for those who were with him, but the priests alone. Kind of be like going into, you know, the, the, the Catholic church and just grabbing the holy water and drinking it, right? Good idea or bad idea? 
Bad idea. Yet Jesus says, hey, you remember David? They went into the temple and they ate the consecrated holy bread. Response to the Pharisees. Verse 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the bread on the Sabbath and are innocent? Saying, hey, the, the priests, they work on the Sabbath, right? We, we work on the Sabbath. We've got volunteers all over this place doing work on the Sabbath, right? Jesus' response. But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. Remember that. You had known what this means. I desire compassion and not a sacrifice. Would not have condemned the innocent, Jesus tells them. Continue on, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Big statement right there. You can imagine how those guys, the smoke comes out of their ears when Jesus says something like that. (laughs) Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? That would have been work, right? Well, one of you guys don't work on the Sabbath. If you had sheep fall in a pit, you'd help it out. How much more valuable then is this man than a sheep? Then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus answers their question. And then he said to the man, stretch out your Stretch it out. And it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. They were happy about the miracle or frustrated? Frustrated. They're like... Not cool. We don't like it. (laughs) How do you think the man felt? Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and he followed him. Healed them all of that. And he warned them not to tell who he was. We've talked about that, haven't we? Why Jesus would say, hey, keep a lid on it for now. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I love God talking about the Savior in terms like that. You'd like that? You catch that? In whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Interesting verse here being quoted from the Old Testament that God is saying that he will Use his holy servant to proclaim justice to who? Gentiles. It's always been the plan that God would redeem humanity through his Savior. Verse 19, and he will not quarrel, he will not cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Jesus was persecuted and beaten and whipped and all of that. Did he make a whole bunch of noise about it? Verse 20, a battered reed he will not break off. Smoldering wick he will not put out till he leads justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Amen and amen. Well, I think it's kind of fun. Again, you guys know me. When I read the scripture, I like to read it with my imagination. I like to try to put myself right there in the place and time. If it's telling us a story of something that happened, then we can just imagine it just as it would have happened, right? And we could sit and think about it. Can you imagine being one of Jesus' disciples going from town to town? They're not jumping on a Greyhound bus. They're not catching a train. They're not cruising in some like awesome new Yukon or something like that. They're walking. Can you imagine? It, it, you've gone on walks, right? Gone out there in nature. Maybe you've taken a, you know, a significant other or walked with your kids and you just go on a nature walk. On a nature walk, you know, these would have just been paths. This wasn't like a really nice asphalt kind of walk or a sidewalk walk. This is walking through a field. And and probably it would be kind of like a cattle path, right, where you can kind of see where the path is. And some places that's where you want to walk, and other places not where you want to walk, right? It's muddy or it's dimpled, and you kind of walk off to the side. Imagine walking with Jesus Christ, and you've spent enough time with him now that it's not like, 
whoa, this is a savior. It's like, yeah, man, it's Jesus. Like we're walking together. We're hanging together. This is what we do. There'd be times where you're talking and just kind of exchanging conversation like on a car trip where sometimes there's a lot of conversation. Other times it's kind of quiet, right? You think it's something that you want to ask or something that you want to say, and then you just say it to him. I love thinking about the disciples spending this kind of time with Jesus. It's like the, that quiet kind of campfire time, right? Well, they're walking through these grain fields, and they're just getting from point A to point B, and some of the disciples, as they walk, grab the heads of grain and just pull it off in their fingers, and they kind of roll it in their hand a little bit, breaking the shell off and the chaff, right? They, you can see them maybe kind of bounce it in their hand blow some of that chaff out of there, and then they're eating it. Well, the Pharisees, it's kind of funny to me too, because again, it's like Jesus always has a crowd. So of course, there's Pharisees somewhere, like hiding behind a bush or a tree and popping out, gotcha, you know? (laughs) Sometimes we feel like that, man. Living our life, and somebody's like, hey, 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 whoa, whoa. And they said, why do your disciples do what is not holy and not legal to do on the Sabbath. Don't you know that it's the Sabbath day? Kind of funny, as I was just considering this, this just jumped in my mind and thinking about it earlier. Depending on how far those Pharisees were from their own house, they were breaking the Sabbath by being far from their house. The Sabbath was full of rules and and regulation. The Sabbath, and when we think about it, we're like, oh, day of rest, that would be so great. Man, I wish I could have one of those, right? But if you were a Jew... A, a, a very holy and devout Jew, the Sabbath day was a hard day. It had been so laden with responsibility and obligation to do absolutely nothing. It was difficult. I read several commentaries about this, and I was putting stuff together. I'm like, I can't even begin to go through all that. Everybody's eyes would roll up in the back of their head. Y'all would go right to sleep. The amount of rules and regulations and the things, they couldn't leave their house, They couldn't start a fire. They couldn't, I mean, they just couldn't do anything. Couldn't lift a weight heavier than a fig, a dried fig. It's like, it was hard. And it was common for people to break the Sabbath traditions because it wasn't just what we have written in here. They had added rule on top of rule on top of rule on top of rule. And I just think that's kind of funny, man. If they were too far, it's like, hey, you guys are breaking the Sabbath. It'd be like, dude, what are you guys doing here? You're too far from your house on the Sabbath day. It was difficult. And we think about last week where Jesus says that, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We just covered that his call for all that would follow him is to come to him. All who are weak and heavy laden. And yet here are those religious leaders, once again, gathered around Jesus, condemning Jesus' people and condemning the Lord himself. Because you know what, Jesus, you're not doing it just right. Did Jesus uphold the scriptures? Yes. Jesus was not the revolutionary that came and said, oh yeah, throw all that old stuff out. I got a really good idea. You need to follow this. No, he didn't do that. Instead, he fulfilled the scripture. And so this misunderstanding that we sometimes have of the Pharisees, I wanted to mention this as well. But sometimes when we think of Pharisees, we think of people who take the Bible really, really seriously, and that those are Pharisees. People that try to hold the standards of the Bible, and we hold it really, really tight, and then we become kind of crotchety and mean, and then we become Pharisees. Well, I think that believers in Christ, when we know who Jesus is, and we follow him, and we, re- we realize the grace that we've received through following him and what he has done in our own lives, we follow him with joy. I don't think that we should be the grumpy, sad, frustrated people. You know, they, they say this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees are very sad, you see. One of the old, because they didn't believe in a resurrection. That'd make you sad. Savior who died dead and wasn't victorious over death. Can't promise you life to come. Amen. Well, so these We're wrong if we think that it's someone who believes in the Bible. We're wrong if we think that a Pharisee is someone who holds it with both hands. We're wrong if we think that a Pharisee is someone who who believes it with every fiber inside of us. That would be us, right? We believe this book. We believe what he wrote. We believe who he is. 
We endeavor by the grace of God to do what he has told us to do. And we're not Pharisees, though we can fall into that. That's not to say we never fall into being a Pharisee. But that's not a Pharisee. See, the Pharisees were adding constantly to God's law. Constantly. Matthew 23, if you're taking notes, eventually we'll get there. Jesus has condemnation to the Pharisees, the eight woes of the Pharisees, where he tells them exactly what they've been doing wrong. See, the law of God said in Deuteronomy 23, 25, it says, when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. This is the law of God. This was what the disciples were doing. They were doing exactly what God had said that we could do because our God, full of grace, who loves the disenfranchised, the hurting, the traveler, the sojourner, sometimes you read in certain translations, God knew as you were going from point A to point B, you didn't have a, a come and go, right? Becoming maverick for Josh's charity there. Uh, you, you didn't have a Casey's. You didn't just pull over and get something to eat. So how did God provide for that? He says, well, when you pass through Israel, it is permissible for you to walk through, pick the grains, the head of grains, but you can't wield a sickle. You can't be like, I got a big family. You know, you can't, no, 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 no. Pick a little. That's all right. And it said that on the, har- on, the, on the Sabbath, you couldn't harvest. But God's heart was not that this was harvest. God's heart was, I love people. People get hungry. Y'all can eat a little bit, and I've provided in these fields, and you can have some. This is God's heart. But yet these Pharisees adding to God's law, adding to the regulations, forgot what the Sabbath was all about, didn't they? Mark 2.27, a recounting in Mark about the same event. Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Mark 2.27, if you want to look at that later, it's a powerful verse. The Sabbath was made for man. God didn't make church every Sunday for him. He's not like, I got an idea. Just to make sure everybody stays good and stays in line and I don't have to crack the whip too much through the week. I'll have on Sundays, everybody will come together and it'll, it'll kind of straighten them out and I will be pleased and I'll sit in my holy heaven and I'll just smile from heaven because they're doing it right. Sabbath wasn't made for that. Sabbath wasn't made that we would just do it right and, and come to church. The Sabbath was made for man. God did these holy days, these days of rest for us. He says, you're the one that needs a day of rest. You're the one that needs it. And so God has instituted the Sabbath day. Adding to God's law doesn't make you safer, holier, or better. This is the point for today from these Pharisees. Adding to God's laws doesn't make you safer, holier, or better. And I put a little sub points here. It gives warnings where God never warned, adding to God's laws. Adding to God's laws adds burdens that God never intended. Adding to God's laws distracts us from what God really said. <laughs> I think about it like this. Um, I, read a, I read a book years ago, uh, A Contrarian's Guide to Knowing God by Larry Osborne. Uh, he really, he really frustrated people with this. And there was an illustration, I'm tweaking it a little bit, but it kind of goes like this. Imagine that you had land, okay? You had a big piece of property. And you had on that property, a lion, all right? Lions, are they uh, meek and mild or tear your face off? Lion will tear your face off, all right? Like you see the people snuggling a lion, you're like, that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Lion will tear your face off. So lions are dangerous. So if you owned your property with a lion, you could put a fence around it. And you would put a sign on there that says, warning, lion. Parentheses, it'll tear your face off. Like, stay out, right? People would walk by and go, oh, good to know. Don't cross that fence, right? If I go in the fence, danger. This is kind of what it's like when you start adding to God's laws. And I see this a lot. I can be guilty of this. Say that you put a fence outside that fence, 
and then you put a sign on there that says, warning lion, it'll tear your face off. Then you put another fence outside of that, warning lion, it'll tear your face off, it'll kill you. And then one more, warning lion. And, and so then you tell your kids, don't go out there, there's a lion out there. And if you cross that fence, it'll tear your face off. Right. What happens if they cross that first fence? Nothing. Man, that sign said it'd tear my face off. That sign said it would kill me. But nothing ever happened. Huh. So then you cross the next boundary. What happens? Nothing. Huh. Dad and mom said that if I cross this boundary, something had happened. Nothing ever happened. Doesn't matter. That sign is a lie. This is a farce. Maybe I can't trust mom and dad. Maybe I can't trust these signs. Then you cross the next one. What happens? Nothing. You start to think, well, how many fences did I put up, right? What happens if you cross that fourth one? You get your face torn off. And that kid or that person, shocked. There was really a lion? This was real the whole time? I had no idea. Friends, this is a problem. For very many years, even inside of the Christian faith, we've said, well, God put a, law, a line right here. I don't want to walk on the line, so I'm going to draw another line over here. And I'm going to tell my kids, do not cross that line. I'm going to tell other people, you better not cross that line. And I'm going to draw another one. And the really holy people stand over here. And the Pharisees say, hey, if you're really, really, really holy, then you don't even pick heads of grain on the Sabbath day and you do it just right. They pick the heads of grain and they're like, God's not mad. Nothing ever happened. Then we start crossing boundaries, crossing boundaries. And guess what happens when you cross God's boundary? Everything he said is true. And we get, it's like a two by four to the head, and we think, what happened? Well, you crossed the boundary of God's boundary, but I crossed all these other things people told me not to do, and none of that ever mattered. Well, no, it didn't, because God didn't draw a line there. This is why we say when we start to put, when we start to align ourselves with God's truth and live in light of his truth, we find reality. We find the world in order. We find how God's really created things. It's, it's what we talk about when our eyes are open, that we understand, oh man, well, there are some things I can do, and it, it, it is, there's freedom there. But there are other things that he has just very plainly said, there's no freedom there. If we draw too many lines so far just to stay safe away from God's law, what happens oftentimes is we give warnings where God never warned, it adds burdens that God never intended, and it distracts us from what God really said. Today, we're going to be having child dedications for parents that are so desirous to raise their children in the faith the best way they know how. And yet, as a parent, my encouragement is to don't fix your rules, your rules, to God's rules. Don't, don't make them the same and with religious veneer on your rules. Because what happens is our kids will break our rules from time to time. And they'll look back and go, well, that wasn't such a big deal. Mom and dad said this, 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 and this would happen. Here's what my encouragement is. We can have rules for our kids and we need rules for our kids. We need rules in our society. Man, people need to know where the boundaries are. But if we put a boundary up, let us be faithful and true in what we testify will happen if they cross it. Let's not fabricate something that's not even real. Let's not puff things up too big and make their kids, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then when they step over it, they're like, well, that never happened. False warnings don't have any teeth. When kids cross that boundary, there's no real consequence. I think about kids, you know... When it, it, there are certain things and rules that we have for our kids that are the law, state law. And we say, hey, this is, this is the law. And our kids, well, uh, and, and then you give them real practical consequences. You don't tell them, well, if you do that, then you'll never get a job or da-da-da-da-da. No, no, no. Start where the practicality is. You're like, hey, well, 
You could probably get away with it a couple of times. But if you get caught, then it is likely you will get arrested or you will get a fine. You're speeding, your fine will be X in amount. Probably not that big of a deal. You do that two or three times, you'll lose your license. I don't know how you'll get to work because I sure ain't going to help you out. At that point, you broke the law three times. Am I right? Give them practical consequences, the reality of the thing. You don't scare them and spook them. And you certainly don't put religious veneer on it. Plus, God's going to hate you. Like, but we've all felt that, haven't we? False warnings don't have any real teeth, and, and we know it. They ruin your credibility. You say, don't do it, it's bad, and then people discover it's not so bad. And they callous us to the truth. And this is the worst. They callous us to the truth. Just like the person going through fence after fence, and they're like, dude, I've read that sign three or four times. There ain't no lying out here. They're just messing around. Bam! I see this in our society constantly. God says how we ought to treat one another. And things like with pornography and how we ought to treat our wife and how we ought to treat our husband. And we go, oh, oh, that doesn't really matter. That doesn't really matter. And then all of a sudden we're looking around and we're like, where'd my family go? Bam, lying. Oh, substance abuse issues and things like that. And I was like, ah, ah, you know, I've done this before, you know, uh, no big deal, no big deal. And all of a sudden, bam, you find yourself in a, literally in a prison cell and you're looking up to heaven and you're saying, God, like to serve you in a way outside of this prison, but I'm done. We need to keep the line as visible and as clear where God put the line as possible. That adds burdens, doesn't it? I think uh, I got a funny illustration for this. It's a lot sillier. So I went to a Bible college, uh, Faith Baptist Bible College. Love that school. Love uh, some of the, the faculty there and stuff, even to this day. So I went, I, I was a drug addict, halfway drug dealer, loving the party life, right? Jesus comes into my life, changes my life, uh, my, the second semester of my senior year, and I have this fabulous idea. I'm going to go to Bible college and learn about the Bible, right? I think God planted that seed, but I had no idea what I was in for. So I go up there, I had Another friend who was very instrumental, Andy, who comes here, he'd been a Christian for a long time. He was like the pressure release valve. When all the rules started getting heaped on, he's like, dude, 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 don't worry about it. Like, chill, chill. I remember one of the rules was that you couldn't, men couldn't wear women's jewelry. Like, that was a rule. It was in the handbook. I'm like, oh, that's probably a good rule, right? I got fined uh, $10 for wearing a Christian cross during a prayer thing, I went to pray for missionaries around the world. It was like an after hours. You had what they called classroom dress, where you had to wear your suit and tie to your classes. But after hours, you didn't have to have classroom dress. You could wear whatever you wanted. So I had, you know, jeans and a t-shirt and my Christian cross. And I got fined for wearing a Christian cross. Now, what that meant was I was wearing women's jewelry, according to someone and that was my question. I said, dude, I got no problem. I'll pay your fine. I understand. But here's my, here's my question. Are you concerned with my spiritual condition because I have become deceived enough that I am wearing women's jewelry in public? Like, could we agree that would be a problem? Men wearing women's jewelry. I know the culture says different. God says, no, that's actually in here. And so they, he goes, I said, are you you're concerned for my spiritual condition. I know I'm at this prayer event or whatever this like that I elected to go to. The guy looked at me kind of dumbfounded and is like, I don't know, man, it's just the rules. He didn't care. He didn't care. And, and this is the thing, it's, it's the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. The spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. And, and we need to know the spirit of God's law. And, and there, there's, a, there's a line we want to know why. We want to know why we're doing what we're doing. And it wasn't a big deal. Ten bucks, so what? The Pharisees in Matthew 24, 24 tie heavy burdens on men's backs and they lay it on men's shoulders that themselves are unwilling to move with so much as a finger. Pharisees will put burdens on people and are like, do you do that? No, I don't do that. 
Adding to God's laws doesn't make you safer, holier, or better. Let's just kind of finish with Matthew 12, 7. Matthew 12, 7 says this, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Three more pages of notes we're not going to do today. I'm like, land the plane. Well, all right. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. What does that mean? Jesus, this, the, the last thing I want to do, I struggle over this like crazy. It's like the last thing I want to do is like, hey, God has laws. Don't worry about it. Just think about what he means. Like, just think about his heart towards it. I, I'm not going to nullify God's laws. But when Jesus says, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. This, this word means covenant loyalty, covenant love. This word is used over 170 times in the Old Testament. I desire covenant love. I, des- I desire you to just love me and be loyal to me and care for me. This is, this is what God's command is here. He says, you should find out what this means. I desire covenant love, man. I desire all of your heart, not sacrifice, not doing it just right. As the worship team kind of makes their way back up. There's a verse that, that I think is really neat in the section that we read today. Verse 20. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory. Worship team's going to lead us in a song, and then stick around because we're going to have our child dedications right after this song. But I want, if you like underlining your Bible, verse 20, I want you to look at it. A smoldering wick he will not put out. You say, Pastor Ben, I broke the rules. Pastor Ben, I was the guy who was heaping condemnation on other people for things that wasn't even in God's law. And and I drove my kids away because I ruled them with an iron fist and I've done it all wrong. But now I'm coming to God and I feel like the world's chewed me up and spit me out. Do you feel battered? Do you feel like your flame is smothered? Have the worries of the world threatened the, the fire of God in your very heart and soul? Can I tell you this? Moldering wick he will not put out. Jesus doesn't come storming in and just start tearing off broken reeds and putting out smoldering wicks and turning over all the people who loved him. No, he's calling you. He's calling you. Friends, let's stand this morning as we close. Lord Jesus, we love you today and I thank you so much that you don't put out a smoldering wick. Lord, if there's someone here today that's just hanging on by a thread, Far be it that a few Pharisees put out their flame. Lord Jesus, you never would. God, would you just draw us to you? Lord, help us to be found faithful and obedient. Father, I pray pray in a moment again for these families that are endeavoring to raise their kids with you. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.